Welcome, welcome everybody to the Bitcoin KE Catapult series on funding startups. Uh, my name is John Wainana Karanja, uh, founder of Bitup Africa, which is a blockchain meetup group. We meet weekly uh, with webinars every Thursday on Bitcoin, mining, and other crypto stuff. So it's a pleasure for me to host uh, two um, exciting crypto startups in the Kenyan space. We have uh, Kotani Pay with the CEO Felix Masharia, and uh, we have Utu Technologies with the CEO Jason Asen. They're, they're, they're there. Welcome, guys. Uh, before I ask them to introduce themselves, um, I would like to sort of set the agenda for today. We're going to be looking at startups, but with a focus on crypto startups. Uh, we're going to be looking at funding startups um, and how these guys have been able to leverage crypto to fund those startups. So the session will be one and a half hours. Um, I want to take about 50 minutes in a discussion with these guys, and then uh, we can have about 40 minutes for Q&A. So get your questions ready. You can post them on the chat, um, uh, but I'll also give you the opportunity to raise your hand and uh, have your questions answered. So without further ado, I think I'll begin with Felix. Introduce yourself, uh, how you got into crypto, what you're doing at Kotanipe, and uh, after that, we'll go to Jason. Thanks, thanks, John. So my name is Felix Masharia. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Kotanipe. I wasn't originally from a tech background. Um, I actually did a medical degree um, in, in university, um, but somewhere around third year of uni, I got very much into tech, had, you know, uh, tech friends who were in Strathmore and, and other universities, and so started exploring the whole um, tech scene in Kenya. Um, in 2016, I read a book um, on blockchain. Uh, it was Blockchain, a Blueprint for a New Economy, written by a lady called Melanie Swan. And uh, soon after, I contacted her. Um, we connected. She had a research institute uh, called the Institute for Blockchain Studies um, that was focused on, you know, the various aspects of blockchain around the world. She didn't have any researchers in Africa, so I, I you know, I, I probed her and asked her to, you know, um, give me a job, and she did. And so I learned a lot in that, you know, in that period where I was mainly, you know, doing research work on rent-seeking tokens on the Ethereum side. Um, then somewhere along 2018, decided to connect with some of my friends um, and, and community and set up EOS Nairobi. Um, EOS Nairobi was a validator for the EOS network. Uh, that at that point, uh, you know, it, it was I think the only proof of stake, you know, blockchain that had really you know taken off. Um, and then, you know, along the way, we discovered how disconnected blockchain was from local payment channels, and that's when we decided to you know um, set up Kotani Pay. So Kotani Pay was set up with the goal of connecting individuals mostly mobile phone users in africa to blockchain protocols uh, and that's that's what we do uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis so enable businesses uh, to send blockchain payments uh, to mobile phone users in africa and enable mobile phone users to connect to uh, blockchain protocols uh, in, in africa uh, which um, blockchain protocols are you guys developing yeah so we are blockchain agnostic um, meaning we can connect to several at, uh, at a time, but we mostly focus on stable coins because of the, you know, the, there's no fluctuation in value. Um, so we, we have USDT, USDC, um, Silo with uh, CUSD, Stella, and, you know, um, now we've just started enabling uh, BTC to mobile phone uh, payments. Very interesting. Um, Jason? Thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, it's great to talk about Utu any chance I get. I'm happy to share our journey and to be here with Felix, who I met, uh, I guess, in what, 2018. Uh, we've known each other uh, when he was running EOS. And it's really great to see now all the success that Katani is having. It's super cool. Um, and yeah. 
Utu's story and my story, they're a bit different. And so I got into crypto and into blockchain really only as an enabling technology to build Utu. Uh, and I actually got into Utu only through discovery of this sort of deeper problem that we encountered on our journey of originally trying to build Maramoja. So let me step back. Uh, I, I'm originally from the US. I grew up in Boston and spent like 10 years in DC. I worked at a consulting firm. Uh, so I studied international relations and uh, then I worked at a consulting firm in DC uh, that was mostly doing uh, donor stuff like uh, USAID and World Bank uh, contracting from those guys. And I started coming to East Africa for them in, in 2011, 2012, spent a lot of time here and had this uh, idea based on a lot of crazy experiences with taxis in Nairobi and a lot of stories from a lot of people about even crazier experiences with taxis in Nairobi and then traveling back to DC and using a bunch of tech powered transport uh, that same day to move about the city and thinking back to the early startup scene in Kenya, but there was sort of nothing with tech for transport at the time, and it wasn't really that sexy maybe, And but it was the early days of Uber in the US, and I think I saw the writing on the wall and I was ready for a change in my life. And I had this idea and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And uh, yeah, two months later, I thought hell with it, quit my job and moved to Nairobi to start Maramoja, which at the time was the first uh, taxi app on the continent. And basically in the process of building Maramoja, uh, pretty early on realized that we were building the wrong thing. Uh, totally building the wrong thing. So we were solving the wrong problem, essentially the same problem that Uber solved. How do I get a taxi? And nobody in Nairobi at the time had the problem, how do I get a taxi? Everybody had the problem, how do I get a taxi that I trust? Uh, and those three words that I trust were incredibly important. And everybody had their answer. Oh, I, got my, I have my guy. I have a guy near the house and I have a guy near the office and I have a guy near the gym and the bar. And if my guy's not there, he sends his guy. And if that guy doesn't come or he doesn't answer, then I call my sister and she sends her guy. And we re realized that basically trust was really about relationships and networks, not about credentials uh, or institutional forms of trust, excuse me, of trust. And so we started to notice this all around that this model of social trust was actually way more powerful. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Like in the real world, if I ask you, who do you trust? I can kind of predict your answer. You'll say, I trust myself, my family, my friends, the people I know. And then online, uh, trust is nothing like that. It's like 50 random people that you've never met and probably have nothing in common with and don't share their biases and their preferences and their beliefs, but maybe they're not even real people. Maybe they're bots or paid reviews or who knows what, but according to these people, this token is great or this babysitter is great or this loan is great. This D5 platform is great. Like who are these people and why are we listening to them and building our foundation of trust around this kind of sort of artificial digital concept. And so Utu was born to bridge the gap between how we trust in real life based on relationships and transparency and how we trust online. So that's what we do. All right, awesome. For those who don't know Swahili, what, what does Utu mean, Jason? Uh, humanity. Stop Swahili along the way. Humanity. You know, we, uh, we thought this made a lot of sense, this idea of like... Uh, uh, the same concept of uh, Ubuntu, right? Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, humanity, uh, we are because you, I am because you are. Uh, it's kind of baked into the fabric of what we do as a company. So it's not just even a clever name. Okay, and we got the three-letter domain. So, yeah, so I think um, I related a lot of what you're saying. Uh, Bit of Africa was also founded on the Ubuntu, Ubuntu spirit. Um, when we started years ago, met Felix, years ago with the OS Nairobi, we all collaborated to sort of build this ecosystem. And um, I'm glad that you guys are you know, still going at it. Um, I also run a startup called uh, Melanin uh, Solar, where we're building um, a distributed energy marketplace, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, on top of Bitcoin and uh, Wife cryptocurrency that also came out of the GitHub. 
So I want us to, because we have some crypto startups in the audience, but we may have some people who are, are, are getting to startups for the first time, or some people who already had startups like you, Jason, but want to, to get into crypto or use crypto. So could um, you guys define number one, what a startup is, uh, what crypto is, and what a crypto startup is? So maybe you can start with you, Jason. Start with me. Uh, sure. So I would say a startup is uh, basically a organization that is optimized for learning, trying to test out some new thing, whether it's a new business model uh, or a new product model or anything that has never been done before or done in a certain way before. Uh, and you're trying to learn and refine to offer something really valuable. Um, and hopefully scale. Uh, so I think that scale part is a key piece of it as distinct from say like a uh, small business. Uh, so it should be something that's scalable. Uh, and what is a crypto startup? Gosh, who knows anymore? Um, it doesn't even require an entity nowadays, does it? Uh, you can be a DAO and organize digitally and have no physical real world manifestation and just uh, vote democratically online. So the definition of what is a startup or what is a, anything is probably changing as we speak, uh, which is super interesting. And I think it's one of the most fascinating things about the sector right now is the different ways people are organizing and how our definitions of what is a startup uh, is going to have to change. Uh, look at hyperscale DAO, which you could say somehow is a startup, but somehow has like, tens of thousands of people working for it. Uh, so how do you classify that? Uh, I don't know, maybe I'd leave it there. I previously thought, you know, a startup is any newly found company, but uh, I've, you know, changed my definition over time. And it's it's usually a company, a company being a group of people um, that is designed to grow fast, right? So like um, just being a business doesn't make you a startup, being newly found doesn't make you a startup. It's usually about reaching an enormous scale. So you have this problem you're trying to solve, uh, or these benefits that you're trying to bring to people, and there are a lot of people who want it uh, and want want to want to use it. And so and so, you know, if 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 I'm starting a small business, let's say like a barber a barber store, a restaurant um, that is targeting my local market, that's not necessarily a startup. So a startup is meant for you know massive growth. Um, then you have the crypto aspect, which is just basically. Um, sort of like a ledger it's a it's a way to keep uh, transactions that is not controlled by any particular uh, central authority um when you when you refer to cryptocurrency you're actually referring to a digital payment system um, that doesn't require a bank or a middle person to verify transactions and so when you're talking about a crypto startup it's usually a, a company a group of people um building on this uh, technology which is um you know uh, doesn't have a middle person or doesn't have a centralized uh, entity that's in charge uh, of it. And of course, now you can, you can, you know, you can, it's, it's across the spectrum where you have uh, companies in the middle and you have DAOs at the end and um, all, all kinds of uh, organizations um, yeah. that, that can be built on this uh, technology. All right. All right. So um, both of you, uh, both of your startups have been able to raise funding and uh, we're going to go into that. Uh, maybe you can talk about funding in the context of a startup, funding from the context of how uh, you've been able to leverage crypto for your startup. And uh, Felix, since you're on the floor, you can. So, of course, when, when you think about funding, you have various kinds of funding and you would probably uh, want to be careful um, before going into this whole raising uh, business because it takes a lot of time. Um, it takes up to, in some cases, 50% of your time. You know, you're just talking to people for almost six months uh, for you to get, you know, funding. And, and I also think that when it comes to crypto, it has provided other opportunities for funding that were not uh, there previously. Um, so when you think about funding and how to, you know, at what stage do you need funding, uh, you probably looking at the various stages of a startup. So you have the ideation stage where you're just, you know, coming up with the idea for the first time um probably have drawn up a canvas um for those ones who don't know what that is there's a very uh, nice model called the business canvas model 
where you have various aspects of a business that you think about. So you have the value proposition, which is what pain am I solving? What gain am I making for the end customer? You have customer relationships. That's how you get your customers, how you keep them, how you grow them. You have channels. Am I going to be delivering my service online or physically or a mix of both? Um, then you have um, the key activities. So what am I going to be doing in this startup on a daily basis? And that then determines the key resources. So what kind of human capital do I need? What kind of uh, resources will I need to run the startup? Who will be my key partners, right? Um, and what will be my revenue streams uh, versus my costs? So the business canvas model is a very good model I found uh, when you're starting on day one, right? So day one is we're trying to solve what pain, what gain are we making? And then trying to solve all the other aspects of uh, the startup so once you ideate um then you have to look for a team you know to work with that will help you build this uh idea with you and for startups it's usually very you know it's, it's crazy because the expectations are sort of like um for people who can uh, push gratification for quite a while right so you're, you're going to do a lot of long and predictable hours uh, you're probably going to have minimal uh, viable compensation, very small compensation for the work you're doing. Uh, you're going to have many days of failure um, as, you, as you try to build out this idea. So you, as you choose your team, sometimes it doesn't, you know, especially if you're not starting with like a lot of cash, like we, we didn't start with any cash. Um, um, yeah. We initially bootstrapped the whole startup. It, it means that you, you you tend to choose people not because of their qualifications or years of experience, uh, but because of the other characteristics they have. Uh, are they driven? Um, are they people who are in this for the long term? Do they believe this thing can grow to something uh, substantial? Um, then once you have your team, then you're going to build your minimum viable product, uh, which is just you know the prototype, the product, and then go and test it out with one customer, and then spread it to the next ten customers, and then you know at that stage then you you you, you can you can scale. So so it's. At the ideation stage, it usually makes sense to accept certain kinds of funding and avoid others, right? So like at that stage, you probably want to participate in a lot of hackathons. It's something we did uh, very much. Uh, luckily yeah. for us in crypto, there's almost uh, a hackathon every other week. <laughs> so so it's, it's usually a way to iterate your idea, make it better, see if people are actually making sense of your, your idea. So at that stage, I would, I would encourage anybody who who can to participate in hackathons. Incubators are also um, nice ways to get some small funding, usually like uh, $2,000 or, or so, $1,000 to $2,000. And that can help you uh, push your startup even further. Then when you move from ideation to the MVP stage, sort of like you have this minimum viable product that you, you have tested with uh, one customer or the next 10 customers, you then want to bring in you know, grants. And, and there are a lot of grants out there as well. Um, you know aimed at different uh, concepts. So like in our case, ours was very much financial inclusion. There are a lot of financial inclusion grants out there. Yours might be targeted at women. There are a lot of women grants out there. And the good thing about grants is they're they are, they are milestone based. So they keep you accountable, uh, but you also don't have to think so much about things to do with equity and you know giving up a part of your company and so on and so forth. And then now maybe after the MVP stage and you have entered into a stage where you actually have a product that's being used by clients and you have started even making some, some revenue, uh, you will want to think about now seed, seed funding if, if that's the way you want to go. There yeah. are people who have gone other routes. So like uh, build a decentralized um, sort of like entity from the beginning. Um, start with a DAO, for example, um, where you have many people um, you know, contributing and for the contributions they're making, they get some tokens. And then you get those tokens to you know an exchange and you know that's how people accrue value uh over time so with crypto there are those those particular options i know jason has done it uh before uh, we we haven't but but what i'll break out uh, they will break it down in terms of funding is you want to think about funding based on the stage uh of of, of growth that you're that you're currently uh, in yeah, excellent i think that was um, a, lo a lot of good um, information there um on bootstrapping and uh, you know when and why you should raise so Jason, um, you know, Felix alluded to the fact that, um, you know, through your experience, you've uh, been able to take a number of different approaches. Uh, maybe let us know how you went about it, what exactly it was, and the challenges you faced along the way as well. Uh, yeah, Felix gave a really great framing of fundraising, I think. And uh, maybe I would just add the fundraising is a burden, not a goal. Right. And I think it's important to keep that mentality 
and uh, because you're not optimizing and building your company to be investable uh it's something that you have to address to basically solve some of the major problems that you will find along your journey of your actual goal and just remember that it uh, it's an enabling technology or an enabling uh, you know feature just like blockchain is an enabling feature uh, it allows you to do what you want to do but it's not the reason we're here and keeping that for uh, keeping that as your focus i would say uh, very much along what felix was saying about iterating on your concept and honing your concept so much more important than raising that early money uh, and even showing that you can iterate on your concept and showing that learning path is probably the thing that's going to be most helpful as you go to raise money and so if you think about that early like how can i document my the path the evolution of my thinking and the evolution of our knowledge of the market of the space of the direction that the product should go and if i can have a very like a uh, linear way of showing how that knowledge has grown those are your metrics that you're going to raise on in the early days uh, and you know there are different options of how to raise uh, grants hackathons uh, it's really great to hear felix talk about these we didn't go this path uh we went straight to the angel investor and then venture capital path and then took a detour into tokens uh maybe not a detour uh like a side step i would say into tokens and they all have their attributes uh and their values i think uh, again it's about thinking about what stage am i at and what do i what am i looking for in an investor and investors are joining your team for a long term right um at least if they're equity investors if they're token buyers uh, there's no telling uh, how long they're with you and it's a very different thing uh you know i actually often make the uh, substantial distinct uh, differentiation from uh between equity investors and token buyers like um equity investors you are a jockey uh the business is a horse and they're betting on you to win the race and whatever they can do to motivate you to encourage you to push you forward as you as you run they're going to do it uh whereas when you're selling tokens i think you should consider yourself more of a musical instrument uh and the token buyer a the musician right you are something to be played for his benefit uh there may be some real alignment there may be some uh, true believers there may be some people that are in it for the long haul but most most token buyers are looking for 10x returns uh, a lot of moon boys uh moon boys and moon girls so I'll be gender neutral on this uh and so you really need to do a stakeholder analysis and understand you know who are the people that are actually going to help my company grow is it a group of investors of angel investors who have certain business connections is it vc investors that have different connections and am i aware of all of the implications of taking on uh, an angel investor or a vc uh, in terms of dilution in terms of control in terms of information rights um do i even understand the terms uh, that i'm being asked about uh or being put to right if someone hands me a term sheet to invest in my company and it has a 5x liquidation preference uh do, um, do i know enough to know that this is not a deal i should take uh so anyone here that hasn't read it probably go read uh, venture deals uh by Brad Feld it's a really good place to start if you're thinking about taking equity if you're thinking about taking uh, raising tokens Uh, I would go and read about a lot of different token uh, sale experiences from the ICO craze in 2017 to IEOs to IDOs and how the token sale space has evolved to DAOs now uh different models that can be used think about does this reinforce my business uh if it doesn't uh so for Utu uh, the trust token plays a critical role in solving one of the core problems that we exist to solve. So our business is about providing trust infrastructure for the entire internet. Uh there's a theoretical problem with trust that our technology addresses, 
but there's also an economic problems, an economics problem or an incentive problem with trust. And that's what our token addresses. And so for us, having a economic mechanism that is baked into the fabric of our company is incredibly relevant and important. Uh, if that's the case for your business, or if you can find the way that that is the case for your business, you may be well advised to raise tokens. Uh, you can also, awesome. by raising tokens, bring in an enormous audience of people uh, from all over the world. And if these people identify with what you're building and the way you're building it, they're going to help you and support you. And you'll realize that you have true believers uh, that just sort of, you know, that like small percentage of people that just intuitively get what you're doing and are totally aligned to it. You'll discover some number uh, of those people all over the place uh, through a token sale that will unlock great opportunity, open doors, make intros, make content and push your brand, push your ideas. And so there's lots of benefits aside from money and doing a token sale. Uh, but you need to be ready for it. The complexity, uh, the scrutiny, the legal structuring, the white paper that you need to write, the game theoretical uh, models you need to probably build, you the token economics, um, it's a lift, right? And it can cost money to do this. So uh, I think there's value to probably uh building for a bit and raising some sort of um non-token based capital to be able to bring on enough resources and have the right people at the table to make a token sale be successful uh it shouldn't be taken on lightly yes you can raise a couple million dollars in a matter of minutes uh, sort of the way we did uh but it wasn't minutes that that token sale took. It was two and a half years plus a couple minutes. Uh, so you didn't see the two and a half years. You saw the couple minutes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I can relate to that. One of the things we we specialize in, uh, as I mentioned before, at uh, Bit of Africa, not doing Melanie Solar, is using proof of work, cryptocurrency mining to bootstrap um, our ecosystem. So uh, together with the community around the world, world we, we launched the wife protocol about two, two years ago um and you know it's since been bootstrapped it has a, a huge network of mining nodes um it's getting on coin market cap um, liquidity is picking up slowly but surely um so there are many interesting different models that you can deploy depending on your skills our background uh, at the team we are mostly engineers so we could actually code and bootstrap a network some of you may be artists, so you may want to use NFTs to to fund your sort of your, your initiatives. I think that's one way that's uh, coming uh, that's becoming more interesting now. Uh, Jason has talked elaborately about DeFi, them raising through token sales on DeFi platforms on Ethereum. Uh, Felix earlier talked about proof of stake um, as one of the mechanisms uh, with. Um, with uh, sort of the validator system. So there are many things you need to do your homework. You need to research quite a bit. Each of them are very difficult to deploy as these guys would tell you, none of them is easy. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a learning curve, but thankfully crypto gives you um, sort of a global marketplace to play with. And also it gives you the tools that are not very, um, um, expensive. You can deploy a smart contract from your bedroom and, and raise funding. Uh, you can create a DAO where the DAO members have never met, but they're holding a lot of money for, for projects. Yeah, so um, I think let's go into now the fundraising process, pitching. Um, and um, I think um, having been involved in the Kenyan space in particular for quite some time, you have people worrying about the ideas. Can the ideas be stolen when they pitch? Um, how can they protect their ideas? Um, what do you guys have to say? We can start with Felix. Yeah, so so I often find that any particular noble idea, uh, and especially an idea that's going to grow into uh, a big startup um, and probably is going to have revenue, is very hard to build, right? So like, even if someone stole your idea, <laughs> they will still have to go through the whole difficulty 
of of building the building building it into a business if it's very easy to build very easy to replicate then you probably don't have a strong business because most businesses in any case have a wide moat that is they have you know a protective uh, you know a moat uh, against against competitors and and then I, I also find i also find it more beneficial to actually get your idea out there and you know have people critique it um have people uh, look at the various aspects of it and it allows you to improve and you know uh, build your idea into uh, a better idea so we are, we are in a world where we, you you can't you know stick with your idea and say no this is mine and you know no one else can 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 build it people people will build something similar to what you're building and it's for you to find out what particular path you want to build uh you know uh, towards so what i'll say is this whole idea of i have this very unique idea that nobody else has thought about i usually say nobody has a monopoly nobody has monopoly of ideas eventually somebody's going to uh, come up with the same idea that you uh, that you had and so it makes more sense to actually get it out there find a team who are passionate about it uh, build the idea um, and then you know uh, launch after that perhaps the, the things that you need to think about protecting are the unique technologies probably the, there are certain unique aspects of your idea um that that give you you know an advantage um uh, and and you need to protect that and that is, is usually in the case of code um but but you know given especially that you're a crypto startup um open source tends to work better than closed source right so like uh, open source is a, is a is a way for people to improve on the code that you put out there and actually makes your idea grow faster than another idea so so you'll always see spin-offs even even within the crypto space you'll see for example spin-offs of uniswap um every other day and um, there's something swap cake swap send a swap and whatnot but like uniswap still is king because you know there is this active community that is building uh uniswap on a daily basis and they're very committed to uniswap's long-term um long-term growth so whatever it is whether it, is, it it's that you're building a crypto startup as a business you know like with investors and you know a board of directors and whatnot or you're building uh, uh, an open source uh, project, the most important thing is you get your idea out there to a team that is committed to building it long term, right? And you it, it, you have nothing to fear. You know, you don't have to fear uh, that your idea will be stolen or like uh, somebody will take your idea and, and run with it. As long as you're building and you have a team that is committed to the idea, uh, it will grow to uh, something, something bigger. Um, interesting. Jason, you have some thoughts to add as well? I don't have too much to add to that. That was pretty on point. Uh, maybe just to say that, yeah, like um, and maybe an idea is like an iceberg. 90% uh, of its mass is below the surface, right? So even if I sit with you and tell you everything I can think to tell you uh, for an hour about what I'm doing, all my secrets, um, you didn't earn those thoughts. I just gave them to you. And there, I, those thoughts were built on a foundation of a lot of other thoughts that got me to those thoughts and that support those thoughts. And that when one of those thoughts proves to be wrong, it's not that I start at zero, I start at nine uh, or one below wherever, you know, uh, you get me. And so you can't steal all that thinking that I've done. Uh, that's, and I couldn't sit with you long enough to share all the thinking that I've done. Uh, and so as soon as you come to a problem after you've stolen this idea, uh, you'll be in a very difficult position because you didn't earn your place to the, get there. And so, yeah, again, I would just echo Felix's point. Uh, there's no fear. Uh, sure. The more you share, the more you'll get back in good inputs and um, course corrections from the world. So, um, yes, and by the way, that's from experience. Someone that very much stole a lot of work that we did, uh, not just like ideas, but uh, specific work documents, uh, uh, brandings yeah. and things like this. And yeah, and you, uh, so yeah. yeah, and if your idea can be stolen that quickly, then it's not really a well thought out idea. Um, like and this is the execution is the thing that will end up mattering anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. So yesterday I was talking to one of our advisors. I was, um, we are at the stage at Melanin Solar where we are structuring a pitch for our seed round. And um, 
uh, what she told us is when you're raising money at the seed round level, uh, so this is after you, you have an idea, you've turned it into a concept, you've tested it in the market, like Felix said, and uh, what you want to do is now test maybe different variants to scale it up. Uh, so she said that you pitch for the money, you don't pitch the technology. Do you guys sort of have any thoughts on that? Because a lot of people struggle at this stage, myself included. Um, how do you pitch to get the money versus pitching? Because we love what we've built so much that we want to tell everyone about it, but they're not really interested in the tech. They want to know how this would be, how this would scale up and maybe become a business one day. So yeah, maybe- I think can I, I have a very simple approach to this. Um, you think about who, what is this person buying? Customers buy your product. Investors don't buy your product, they buy your company. So for an investor, your company is your product. And so how would you sell your how would you sell or talk if the product were your sell, you were selling were not your product but your company? Well, your company comprises many things, and your product is one very important one, but the team that pushes it and the strategy that they'll take and the business model that will earn you money. These are all equal legs of the stool that is your company. And that's the product they're buying, not your product. So we all entrepreneurs love our product. That's why we start our business for the product. Uh, but thinking about putting ourselves in the investor's shoes, they're buying a company, not a product. They want to know that all five, seven legs of that stool are sturdy and sound. Great, Felix? Yeah, I think I wouldn't agree agree more with what Jason has said. Uh, he provides a very good mental model uh, of thinking about your pitch, right? So like when we talk about pitch, most entrepreneurs, myself included, initially think you know, of the structure, like what, what do I need to put in? What do I need to leave out of the pitch? Uh, for me to, you know, to capture value or have these investors invest in, in my company. But by the end of the day, what you're really, you know, telling is a story. And then you also want to tell a very comprehensive story, right? So like um, the initial pitch, which is your elevator pitch, will have maybe just four aspects that you really want to emphasize. Probably you'd have what your solution is, uh, the one liner, um, this is what we do. Um, and these are the unique advantages of, you know, our product. Uh, then you'll have probably a traction slide that shows this is a growth that you have experienced um, and a market size slide and probably a team slide. That's yeah. it, right? Yeah. Um, that's just meant to capture someone's attention, you know. But after that, um, you're into like six months of questions uh, on the various aspects of your business. And this now comes to Jason's point, which is you need to understand your business in and out. like understand the internal aspects of your business and the external aspects of your business. So like you'll find investors asking you about regulation, about competitors, about uh, why your business is better than so-and-so's, about um, what what your team has uniquely that, you know, uh, make sure they get to the end. How do you deal with KYC? How do you do, deal with compliance? So I often find that the, the, the elevator pitch is just an attraction. It's just something to get someone interested uh, but immediately after that, the pitch is actually usually like three to six months long, you know, as you're trying to convince this person, this is the right business to invest in because we have all these aspects covered. We have licensing covered, we have regulation covered uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I think that startups do, some startups do very well with the initial elevator pitch, but after the elevator pitch, they haven't, you know, thought through a lot of these other aspects and that's where they're not able to, able to, able to raise. Nice, nice, nice. So, um, I think from those aspects that both of you have mentioned, uh, we have the idea of the concept, um, the traction, uh, the market size, and the team. The team is probably aware there are a lot of issues. So how, how do you structure a good founding team? Felix, you're on the mic, so you can start. Yeah, so like I said before, um, t- teams in startups are uniquely different from like, you know, if you're working in a company, right? Like. In a startup, you're looking at a very long, like delayed gratification. Um, you probably will be working very hard on something that's not being, bearing any fruit uh, for quite a while, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're lucky, that's a year or two. Uh, if you're not so lucky, uh, like in the case of Bionic, who I think uh, now are a unicorn or something, you're looking at like seven years, like in, yeah. in, in that thing. So to actually get people who you can work with for seven years 
is 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 something that you need to look just beyond experience and qualifications like i said uh right you need to look at number one are these people driven uh do they have self-directed you know self self-directed learning um are they people that can stick you know longer you know with minimum viable compensation uh because things often go wrong in the startup so you're projecting you'll get to a certain point by a certain time and it doesn't work out and you have to go back three steps and you know four or five steps so you need to really it, it's about um what is this it's about the character of the people you're working with more than their qualifications and things like that because if you find a very highly qualified individual who's not committed to the story um immediately you know shit hits a fan they're out of the startup they're probably going yep. on to do other things with their skills uh, right um, but that doesn't mean that you also don't need highly skilled people like you need uh you know people who are also competent in what they do so you need to determine what positions are important to to fill uh at the, at the very beginning um so so for example in kotani when we were choosing our co-founders we were like we're choosing people who we know are not going to leave the startup no matter what they'll burn with the house uh, but number two um they have that you know level of competence that is required to push this startup uh uh you know forward uh faster so so that's what i would say about you know an an initial founding team um it's, it's more about the character than 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 anything else yeah that is so true my, my co-founder and i have known each other for 10 years so being in this startup is like a marriage but without the joy of a wedding right so <laughs> you have to be able to tolerate yourselves because it's, it's gonna the ups and downs will be you know uh, quite 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 insane Um, and of course, and case, of course but, yeah. yeah that's that's the other point which is that yeah. you will probably need to do a lot of collaboration and negotiation right so like yeah, yeah. it's not I'm boss and you follow what I'm supposed to say you yeah. probably need to negotiate and collaborate a lot with your co-founders for you to get to the the next stage yeah that's that's so true cuz even myself as CEO um sometimes I have to let my co-founder make the final decisions on some aspects that is more qualified on So that's that's very true. Jason? Yeah, I think it's really easy to uh, get sucked into the like well they're available uh, mindset when you're starting. Uh you maybe feel desperate and you're looking for someone that can help you move forward and you don't really have much to offer or you don't feel like you have much to offer and so you accept people that are sort of there and want to be involved and that's sort of the the threshold for being involved and it's um there's some amount of that that maybe inevitably happens uh but you really need to avoid think this type of thinking and really instead think about like well, what do we actually need what type of person actually complements what i bring uh so for instance my co-founder bastian uh he and i are kind of total opposites uh in total complementary ways uh the joke is often he's our chief technology officer and i'm our chief talking officer uh which is fine uh, we both are extremely valuable um and so i think having a partner that complements you uh that you respect and they respect you and Uh, other than that um you know those are the foundations complementarity and respect uh everything else can be uh gained like even skills can be gained right like uh a lot of times we want to look at a candidate for a job and be like oh they don't have all the skills to be this role well you probably also don't have all the skills to be your role do you uh, i certainly did not and still don't have all the skills i need to be a ceo and I'm acquiring them as I go. So the question is not does this person have all the skills that they need, but is this person in it? Will they learn those skills? Are they committed? Do they have the resilience? Do they have the values that I respect, uh, the expertise that I respect, uh things like this. Yeah, very very interesting. I think that was um a great uh session on pitching. Let's now talk about uh investors. How do you find uh good investors or, or even this Let's start with grants. How do you get grants? Because I believe you all started with some form of grants. Um, then how do you get um, your angel investor or what you call pre-seed investors? Then finally, how do you get your seed investors? 
from Nairobi. If you're, you're based here in Nairobi, you may not have much exposure. How, how did you guys sort of uh, tackle this uh, issue? I can't really say too much about grants. Uh, I can talk about uh, Angel, uh, Angel First Angels for sure. Um, yeah. I met our first angel uh, in a very typical way, I would say. We applied for and pitched at uh, Pivot East in 2014. Uh, so I started uh, Maramoja in 2013, and we built for a year and a half uh, until I think it was like June, July 2014, uh, Pivot East. And I remember there was a guy in a nice looking suit uh, that uh, went to sit in the audience for one of the sessions. And I thought, hmm, he looks like he could be an investor. Let me just go and sit next to him uh, and chat him up. And turned out he was an investor who was uh, running a small family office. And uh, a month later, he became our first investor. Uh, so uh, for me, it's about putting yourself out there and just uh, initiating a lot of conversations. I say that and you, uh, like, oh, we, I went up and talked to this guy and then he became our first investor. What I didn't say is, the other 150, 500 guys that I've gone up and talked to and told me to get the F out, like uh, something like this, right? Uh, sometimes they don't say anything at all. Sometimes they say, oh, interesting. Uh, you get the long no, uh, which is can be painful, right? Uh, they just drag it out. They keep asking another document, another document, another document. Eventually that is going to be a no, though, uh, once you get into that. But I would say there's so many opportunities now uh, in terms of events to meet investors, to build relationships by attending things you're interested in. Uh, I would caution people against networking. Uh, networking, people see through. Uh, uh, you're not as clever as you think you are. And you, when you're out there networking people, they feel it. And it's kind of gross, right? Nobody likes that. And so I would advise people don't network, but be a person and meet people and be interested in what people are building and be passionate about what you're building and let the passion come through. Let your interest, authentic interest in what they're doing come through and build relationships uh, because you're not trying to get something out of somebody. You're trying to see if your paths align uh, in any way. Uh, what do I mean by, I see there's a question, what do I mean by networking? Networking is going out with uh, the explicit intent of, I need, I need this, I need to raise money, I'm here to raise money. Do you have money? If you don't, next person, please. It means you're looking for the guy with the grayest hair, or maybe you're looking for the old white guy or something, uh, unfortunately. Uh, this, like, uh, people don't like being networked, sought out for one specific purpose, and then discarded if they if they don't fit. Uh, it's about building relationships. Um, so, how how do you identify uh, good investors versus toxic investors? Maybe I can talk about you know how we went about our journey of finding investors, and then um, talk about the characteristics you have learned um, to to look at. Um, so, what one of the I think things we did, our, our experience is very different from Jason's. Um, yeah, we, we, we build within ecosystems. Because um, if you think about yourself, even you know, as, a, as, a, as a human being or as, as, an, as an animal, you, you need an ecosystem for you to uh, coexist or for you to, to, to grow. So we're very much in initially the EOS ecosystem and then change that to, um, we entered the silo ecosystem sometime in uh, 2019. And the reason why we were so attracted to the silo ecosystem was the mission. They had uh, both for financial inclusion as well as you know all the characteristics of the technology they had built. So they had a stable coin um, that was baked into a protocol that had very low fees and um, that was mobile fast, mobile friendly, and so it was very easy to build a product like Botanipay on top of such a protocol. Right. So you want to build within an ecosystem uh, fast um, because it allows you to then uh, get to the hackathons and actually win the hackathons. 
uh, get to the grants and, and actually get grants to build within that ecosystem and so on and so forth. So, so my advice for anybody who's starting out in Nairobi uh, and is looking to grow their startup is why don't you just join a place where people um, sort of like are in the same mission that you're in and try and grow with them, right? And that gets you to the next level, which is uh, the seed stage where now you can probably join an accelerator, go and talk to investors, know how to pitch and, and, and all that stuff. But initially, perhaps uh, uh, ecosystem growth is important. So that then brings the next aspect, which is what kind of investors are we looking for? So we, just like Jason, have met hundreds of investors <laughs> since we, we started. And within the first three minutes of you know, a conversation with an investor, you can very easily tell whether this investor is aligned with what you're doing or they're completely off-field. Right. Um, so we often find that the best investors are the ones that are already within your space. So they like they understand, in our case, people who understood crypto very well and people who understood Africa very well. Right. So yeah. it was either a mix of, of those two, you're either an African investor, uh, an African tech investor, or you are a crypto investor and you understand uh, the problem and, and how that problem is is you know solving things and then of course the other aspects of you know the personal character of the person there are people who will give you capital and it will be patient capital and then there are people who want to deliver and they want to squeeze you quickly so that they can you know flip you um for the next round for series a and so on and they don't give you time to time to grow right so like some of those aspects you can always see in the kind of questions these people are asking uh the people who are very focused in uh, how much can you make in the next one, two months uh, so that they can easily flip you and move on to the next startup. And there are people who are more interested in where do you see yourself in the next 10 years and what are the key milestones for you in the next six months, right? So like that's somebody who's very long-term oriented. So you want to choose investors who are long-term oriented. You want to choose investors who understand uh, your your industry very well or understand African investing very well. Awesome, awesome. So, so what, what are the four key questions that... Uh, we should expect from investors in general? Probably is for your first raise, <clears throat> I think it's probably, do I believe that the problem that you're solving is actually a problem? Do I believe that the solution you're proposing is actually a solution to the problem? And do I believe that your team is actually a team that can pull that off? Uh, it's probably those three questions at your first phrase and maybe a fourth question of uh, how big is the opportunity uh, if you do pull it off. Uh, that's how I would think about it. You can break that down and say, uh, you know, team, revenue, mo uh, but it's really those four questions. All, all right. Felix? Yeah, yeah. Uh, same, same. Uh, I think it's it's all about what problem you're solving, what solution you are you're coming up with, um, the market size. So how big is this problem, right? If if we were to give it all, and if even if you were to take 100% of the market, how big are we looking at the market? And, and that's usually impossible. You're probably looking at 30% of the market, and yeah. then uh, maybe an additional one would be on top of team would be traction. So like since you started. Uh, how much have you so far achieved, right? Like, what have you built? Um, uh, do you have any customers that you've tested it uh, with? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So for the first raise, those are usually the five, I think, major areas investors are mostly interested in. Yeah, I have to add, uh, I have to add that fifth one. I have to acknowledge that uh, it's not just, uh, it's that last bit too about how far have you come. Okay, so we, we are about to go into the audience's session of asking questions. Um, I think one of the, challenges that um, we face is in terms of investors shying away from um, uh, investing in startups that are domiciled in, in Kenya and truthfully speaking in Africa. Um, and this is why probably one of the main reasons why people complain that um, funding seems to go to startups that are, uh, are uh, sort of non-indigenous because it's easier for them to sort of be outside Africa. So what are your thoughts on this? Because um, this is sort of the question that people don't really bring up, but is it's the elephant in the room. What structural issues are facing um, uh, entrepreneurs who are based in Kenya and Africa in general? And how can they, so how did you guys remedy this, this issue? So we, we um, it, it's true 
Uh, most investors and especially U.S. investors don't like to invest in an entity outside the U.S., right? Like uh, they will insist very much that you're in the U.S. The other um, other area I've seen um, is Singapore. I think um, there are startups that, you know, have, have converted. So even, even Kotani, they had to convert at some point from a Kenyan entity to a Delaware entity. Um, and of course, there are, there are a lot of things to think about when you're doing this conversion. Uh, it often means that you are going to pay a hell lot uh, in legal fees. Uh, hopefully, you get to do this after your round, or hopefully, you get uh, uh, lawyers who are willing to wait uh, until you you raise. But there's that whole is that there's that conversion from like a Kenyan entity to a Delaware entity, which takes quite quite a lot in, in both time and, and 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 funds money. What what I've noted and it sort of like encourages me a lot is that investors are not so much interested in the color of your skin or like. Um, where you come from, they don't care. Um, they're interested in number one, the market, right? Like, if you're very much domesticated, like you, you're only thinking about Kenya. Uh, guess what? Kenya is a very small market, right? Like you're, you're looking at just about 44 million people. Um, you know, 30 percent of that is small market. Um, and like we said earlier, startups are companies designed to grow very fast, right? So if you're if you're going to be a company that grows very fast, you need a very big market to basically grow in. So it's very easy for, for example, an Indian uh, um, startup or a Chinese startup uh, to grow fast because their, their local market is in any case very big, right? And even in Kenya, uh, if you compare, sorry, even in Africa, if you compare a Nigerian startup with a Kenyan startup, the Nigerian startups tend to get you know even more funding because their market is quite big. One out of every five Africans is Nigerian, 200 million people, right? Um, so, so you need to come into the game, at least with the mindset of growing beyond your local market. You know, target regional markets, East Africa, target Africa, if you can. Think about a product that can serve a wider market than your local market. Um, then number two, be willing to be flexible, especially with the, with the you know, jurisdiction aspect. Uh, because in our case, we started here in Kenya. Uh, we have so far, spread to Ghana, Zambia. We're looking to be live in six uh, African countries by the end of the year, which means that in every new jurisdiction you go into, there are you know, licenses and things to deal with. Um, and so you have to be very flexible. You have to move from the Kenyan, I'm a Kenyan mindset to I'm an African or like I'm a, I'm a global citizen uh, kind of mindset. Jason, for example, is not necessarily from Kenya, but he's building a, a product and he's solving a solution in Kenya. Uh, right from the US. So I think that African entrepreneurs can limit themselves sometimes by just thinking I need to build a local solution from my local market. If that's the case, then there's no problem. That's a small business or it's a medium-sized business or even a large business, that's that's okay. But if you're thinking of building a startup that people are willing to invest in, then you need to have that sort of like African or regional or uh, global uh, m m mindset. I... I have a similar approach probably as Felix on the jurisdiction. I, I think it's very much uh, to be flexible and start simple and not overcomplicate it. Uh, uh, you should have just enough structure to get done what you need to and no more, right? Uh, what you don't want to end up with is a whole lot of structure uh, and that you end up spending your life doing KYC and trying to pull together registra registrar documents and uh, change directors and things like this. And for sure, investors are looking at jurisdictions and we got forced into or sort of arm twisted into jurisdictional decisions because we needed capital at times in our past. Uh, and these are decisions that you have to make uh, on an ongoing basis uh, as they come up. And sometimes you make this, sometimes you'll do it. And sometimes you're in a position where you can say, no, that's not a jurisdiction that we want to be in. At the end of the day, if you are going to scale, you should recognize that it's all going to change. Uh, and it's all going to sort itself out in the time when it becomes relevant to be sorted out doesn't mean like you can just wait and procrastinate and not do anything about your structures and entities or whatever you should be thinking though 
uh, that let's not overcomplicate it. So a lot of people want to go for maybe a Mauritius structure from the beginning because they heard that Mauritius has all these double taxation avoidance treaties and all of these, uh, you know, uh, very low income corporate income tax and all of this stuff. Well, what they don't, what you don't think about is that how long is it going to be before you are making so much profit that you're worried about mitigating your taxes on your profit? Like it's probably at least five, six, seven years, maybe into the future, right? And yeah. they don't tell you about all the hidden costs of what it takes to do business in that country and setting things up. And every time you want to issue shares or change a director or do this or do that, you're going through a management company, sending a wire, uh, even, uh, simple, simple things, right? And so set up, set up in Kenya. And if a investor is turned off because you're in Kenya, uh, then maybe they're not the right investor uh, and they don't understand that that can be changed as you grow and that that was the right place to set up to get going uh, because you're focused on building product, on driving sales, not on optimizing future tax structures at the moment. Like there's a time for everything, but now is not the time for that. Uh, there's uh, That being said, there are choices that you can make from the beginning that aren't hard to make that maybe put you in a better position. You can register a company in Singapore really easily. You can register, I think it costs a dollar and you can do it online. Uh, you can register a company in the UK uh, on Companies House online. And in the UK, they have really interesting tax credits like uh, uh, R&D tax credits which are actually relevant for you in the first couple years of your journey rather than the later years of your journey. So think about, okay, if I'm going to go to a jurisdiction, uh, is there money available in that jurisdiction in the form of tax credits that are relevant to me now, uh, right? Solve for now. Uh, don't worry too, too much about the perfect structure in the future. It will come. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. So I'm um, taking some questions from chat. Um, and I have some initial questions. I'm sorry, I cannot see who they are from because my my, con my connection dropped. So I think some of these questions our panelists have already answered. So I'll go to one that has not been answered. What are your opinions on being a solo founder? We can start with that. I've never been a, I've never been a solo founder, so I wouldn't know, but I could imagine it's really hard. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do it. Felix, the same, I guess. Same yeah, yes, same, same answer. Um, probably need some Elon Musk kind of <laughs> resilience. <laughs> or you need some uh, stimulant that uh, is quite strong. Yeah. Yeah. Are crypto startups in Africa really receiving the same crazy attention like their counterparts in the fintech space? And when fundraising, does the question of regulations comes up come up from investors. I guess this is in crypto. Are crypt African crypto startups getting um, huge attention? It depends on how you look at it. Um, so um, if you look at the African fintech space, um, it didn't start like yesterday. Uh, yeah. You have companies like Interswitch have been around for the last 17 years. Um, Chipa Cash has been around since I think 2013. And a lot of these startups have been at least around for six, around for around six to 10 years, right? So like they're really reaching their peak, right? This is a peak of FinTech in, in Africa uh, in terms of, of, of growth. Crypto startup attention is there um, if you plug into the right ecosystems, right? So like there are a couple of uh, blockchain protocols that are looking at Africa very much and we're very interested to connect to Africa. And if you're building within those particular ecosystems, then you have all the support you need uh, to grow your startup. But in terms of, you know, uh, crypto startups receiving funding, it's just a small fraction of you know, the amounts that are going to, to, to fintech in Africa. And then in regards to regulation, regulation is a question you will face all the time. Uh, if you're building a startup like mine, um, that's, you know, uh, connecting to blockchain protocols and uh, having crypto, that is something that you need to read about you need to discuss with your lawyers about you need to have a very deep knowledge on uh okay not not to the extent of a lawyer but like at least enough to 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 answer questions because it will always come up in in discussions you have with with uh 
with investors and that's where again it's important to choose the right investors right and that's you need you need uh, investors who have some industry um experience right so like people who have invested in crypto startups before or have invested in african startups uh payment startups before all right jason any thoughts on um, the crypto space in africa is it getting the right amount of attention and uh, regulations around crypto? Uh, i guess i would uh first make the point that we need to think of uh, actually it comes back to your first question about what is a crypto startup and is there a one to one overlap between a crypto startup and a fintech and i would say the answer is no not all crypto startups are fintechs if we're defining a crypto startup by a company that deals with cryptocurrency in any way or uh, even has its own token and i think as we get more and more accustomed to this uh, that label will be less and less relevant of what's a crypto startup and what isn't uh, at the end of the day it's a mechanism that we use to drive a value proposition uh, or to fundraise uh, so utu is not a crypto startup utu is a trust company or a trust startup we deal in trust infrastructure we care about trust infrastructure we use uh ai and blockchain and cryptocurrency just the same way we use python and uh angular and react right uh, they're all tools and so thinking about what a company is trying to achieve rather than maybe how it achieves it is the most relevant and then just to maybe come back to the previous topic about jurisdiction a little bit um i i don't want to give the impression that jurisdiction is not important uh and that you just incorporate anywhere wherever you happen to be uh for instance we did a token sale and doing a token sale from kenya from a kenyan entity would have been very difficult uh, and inadvisable um kenya has for the longest time had a a very formal stance towards crypto of the central bank governor feels ick about it uh that's not really a policy though uh, and it's really hard to build a company when the official government policy is that the bank governor feels sketchy about something and that's kind of all the guidance you have and so you want to look for a place that has predictability uh and that has a framework that you can work within uh so there's a lot of options nowadays even stuff that you can do on chain spin up a real world entity using a wallet or a dao or a gnosis vault uh, safe as the entity uh, to own that real world entity so you think about what that means uh in terms of domiciling a company in a place that's like ideally suited and doing it pretty much automatically or kind of pretty easily in a couple click point and click and pay steps online with crypto. All right, I have two more questions here because I really want the audience to 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 hear the voices from the audience. So, um I'll give one to Jason and one to Felix. Um so the question that I have here is how can startups and their founders ensure that investment of funds they receive a clean from uh, genuine sources because uh, some startups are used to clean money i think that's true so i'll give that one to felix and to you jason is how much money is required in the bootstrap bootstrapping phase i actually uh, switched uh, the bootstrapping question to felix how much money is required for bootstrapping uh, to an mvp and then for jason since you dealt with uh, different kinds of investors how do you ensure that the money is uh, clean you're giving me the trust question how fitting yes. Uh, yes yeah uh companies should be uh getting to know their investors like and and vetting their investors as much as the investors are getting to know and vetting the companies right there's a couple things here there's like um understanding the person that you're going to be work with working with and evaluating them as an individual and then there's the kind of formal KYC AML requirements and generally speaking you're going to have to collect a bunch of documents from the investor uh to be able to receive investment from them uh your bank will ask you for it when you're when they're transferring funds like the source of funds 
so there's a lot of standard checks uh, that you need to do and documents that you'll need to collect if you're raising equity or a safe uh, or anything in the normal kind of legal system. Uh, if you're raising online via tokens, uh, this becomes a much bigger issue and it's definitely advisable to use a KYC uh, system to basically understand who are your investors and make sure that you're not a taking uh, any money that's dirty, but also make sure you're not taking money from people in jurisdictions where it's illegal for them to purchase your token. Uh, so both things are critically important to staying on the right side of the law, unless you want to take the approach of move fast and break things, in which case you spit up a DAO on anonymously and let it run a uh, let it run a some faceless memberless corporation in some country, remain totally anonymous, uh, use a fake Twitter, use a fake. And this is a and I'm, I say this sort of jokingly, but this is actually a viable path nowadays, right? Uh, we talk about the racial bias in investing and okay, Felix says he didn't think it's about race. Uh, the numbers seem to disagree and it, there seems like there is a bias towards white people in funding, uh, especially here in Kenya and in the crypto world, you can actually eliminate this. You can go totally in on and, and create, uh, avatar pro based profiles. Don't link them back to your real name and face and do everything online and uh, this is an option that's available to us now uh, and then i guess maybe you don't care about the kyc but I, that part gets a little uh, gets a little uh, risky so different paths now uh, that's what this technology is opening up for us awesome uh, felix bootstrap yeah so for the bootstrapping aspect uh, you probably going to have a lot of your resources going to you know develop our technologies tools if you are a tech startup and uh, human capital. Um, so you want to budget based on that. So you want to find people who can work, like I said, with minimum viable compensation, knowing that, you know, their compensation will increase sometime in future. Then you also want to, um, you know, do a budget of the developer tools, especially, you know, servers, things like that. If you need a Google Cloud account and so on, that you'll be using on a monthly basis. Once you have that budget, then you can, you know, find ways to raise those funds. So in our case, for example, the validator work we were doing before in EOS was very critical in helping us bootstrap uh, Quartani when we started. And you can find other ways to, to do it, um, you know, if you have a rich uncle or you have uh, uh, some other assets uh, out there. But basically, the 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 the, 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 the most, I think, expensive um, things when you're starting out, because when you're starting out, you're just doing a simple legal, um, you know, structure. Uh, for example, in Kenya, which is, is I, I would say, quite affordable, but um, things like human resource and um, technology tools tend to be the bigger part of the budget. All right, all right. So let's go now to the audience questions. I believe we have 15 minutes or so. Then uh, if we have time, I'll come back to the couple of questions that have been asked in chat. Uh, so um, let's see who's raised their hand. And then... Uh, we'll, your, your, your mic will get unmuted. So can I see any raised hands? Bethony, Bethony's hand is raised. I'm um, actually only gonna have time for one question and then I'm gonna have to run, unfortunately. No problem, no problem. So let the first question go to Jason. So- Hello guys, uh, I'm glad to see everyone here. I enjoyed the chat. And uh, my question will be, how much will you be willing to give to investors initially because there are really greedy people out there and uh there are sharks and trying to eat the whole cake at the beginning so it's really important to understand uh if you're willing to get something from them you you are you should be willing to to give them uh something but uh um, i would like to have your your, your stance on that sure and I'm feeling underdressed, uh, man, my nice style. Um, you know, the answer, how much you should be give it, willing to give away. Uh, I struggle with that framing um, because you're getting. Uh, how much am I getting? Uh, like thinking about dilution is, is really a distraction. 
you should be thinking about how big can I grow with what these people are giving me in terms of the capital, right? And not how much dilution am I taking? You may take 10% dilution and the money they give you may 100x your revenue. Was it a good deal or a bad deal, right? Yeah, you got diluted 10%. You grew 100x. You have a much bigger pie. Thinking about the size of the pie, not the size of the slice, right? Uh, I'm not saying like uh, give away equity, like fast and loose and any, you know, like uh, Oprah style, some equity for you, equity for you, equity for every. No, it's not that. It, it's uh, think about what can I, how can I grow and how big can I get with the capital that I'm getting? And is it more than the dilution that I'm facing for getting, for taking it? And if the answer is yes, the growth that I can achieve is more than the dilution, then you should definitely take that capital. And if the answer is, uh, you know, someone wants to give you $10,000 for 50% of your business and it only gets you like three months down the road and you still have nine months uh, left of product development uh, before you get somewhere so you, that's probably not the right deal, right? Uh, you're not getting the increase in your valuation uh, commensurate with the dilution that you're facing. So uh, I don't think there's a right, a wrong amount. It depends on the product you're building. If you're building uh, a space shuttle, uh, you need a lot of capital and a long time to do it. You're probably going to have to take heavy dilution. If you're building something more uh, down to earth, huh? no pun, okay, pun intended, um, then maybe you can get a heck of a lot further uh, towards your goals, towards revenue without capital and be able to raise just when every other problem that can be solved with things other than money has been solved and you just now need some money to push you over the last uh, kind of hurdles. Um, that's a great time to raise and that's a great dilution to take when you get ca in, when incoming cat capital is catalytic for you. I hope that answers your question. At least yeah. that's my approach. Great, thanks. So thank you, Jason. Um, I think thank you, you guys. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. John, thanks for hosting. And David, thanks for inviting me. And Felix, wonderful to be a co-panelist with you. Awesome. All right. Cheers, guys. All right. See you, thank you all. All right. So um, any question for Felix now? We, we do have uh, 10 minutes or so, so you can also raise your hand. Then you get unmuted. If not, I'll uh, let Felix answer the last two questions from chat. Um, any hands up? All right, no hands up. So Felix, um, here are the last two questions. I think Jason just answered the last chat question. I think actually these questions have been answered. So let's wind up. Um, Felix, thank you so much for sharing your experience with um, uh, you know, fundraising and crypto. Um, I mean, I just I remember the day you started with US Nairobi. It uh, seems like ages ago, but it was just probably four years ago maybe. So yep. um, to see you um, having a startup that's uh, sort of growing across Africa and uh, also raising money is uh, quite great and encouraging to young people. So uh, thank you, David, for allowing me to be the moderator. This is a great community. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm hosting a webinar tonight. Uh, you can go to at Bitup Africa on Twitter on uh, bootstrapping using uh uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency mining, and the wife protocols for those of you who want to bootstrap that way. And, uh, you know, once again, thank you all for attending. Asante sana. And uh, see you soon with startups. <laughs>